Now it's recording. <laughs> had a great conversation about how Submittable is free. You can go check that out yourself. It's submittable.com. And I'm now talking about Duotrope, which is not free, but gives you, it's $50 a year and it gives you some more um, nice things. And I'm showing them right now. So I'm going to go back to my submission tracker. This is my own submission tracker on Duotrope. And Duotrope keeps stats on these different magazines, but not all the magazines, as you can see. And so in the right-hand column, there's like the average time that it usually takes them to, to reply. And I was really excited about this Don't Tread on Me one that I've most recently been, most recently been submitting because it was at Smoke Long Quarterly and they always reply within 14 days. It had been 10 days and I'm like, oh, this is a good sign. Then I went into my submittable, which is the submission manager they use, and they had rejected it four days earlier, but didn't send the automatic email. So here I was thinking I was doing great and it had already been rejected. So, mm -hmm. you know, you have to use a couple different systems to keep things straight. If the, for example, um, well, I'll go back to submittable, but Smoke Long Quarterly used submittable. So if you see these tabs, I can go to declined. And that's how I found it. I went to declined and I was like, oh, look. <laughs> and so um i can also mark like file shares i really it's that was like a you know toss to the moon because they're a really prestigious magazine um they declined this flash that i have these three folds in time but they don't use submittable so that's why the box is red but white in the middle um, i'm tracking it on here but they, they don't use this process. And so then on Plowshares, uh, Plowshares on Duotrope, um, I can sort these submissions by what has been declined, right? And so um, they call it rejection. I think declined is a nicer word, um, especially because a lot of people, it just doesn't fit in the way they put the magazine together. And so it's not so much that your writing isn't good sometimes, but that it just doesn't fit the, the product they're making that time. So here's all my rejections. You know, I'm out mm -hmm. there, which is nice. Um, and then you can see like, you know, on the averages and things like that. Okay. Where do you even find these magazines and That's these journals? The thing I'm gonna do, what a great question. <laughs> so I, I have no idea where to send things. Right, <laughs> here's the main page for Duotrope. And that was the very next thing I was gonna talk about, which is, if you want to send somewhere, um, the front page of Duotrope is a great place to find stuff. And again, it's $50 a year. But for me, I think of that as you know, like $4 and 10 cents a month, which is more than worth it. Um, so for example, you can go to publishing news. I'm clicking that green publishing news. And these will be nonfiction publishers that are added, right? But you can also just search period search for um, things by a category, you know, so here's stuff by fiction, nonfiction, and you just have to play in here. So like, I'm mostly doing journals, magazines, and online publications, although I'm sending that one flash out to contest competitions and prizes, right? So you can look in these areas under the different genre, right? Fiction, nonfiction, poetry, and visual art. Um, and then you just start digging around. And so here's something I know, for example, um, I can click on journals, magazines, and online publications. You're going to get this huge list, right? But um, you can talk to people. Where's the rest of my list? <laughs> you can talk to people. You can read around. One of the great things to do is take a look at this list and see names that are attractive to you and start reading around. Or go to sources like Lit Hub or um, but Lit Hub's just what comes to mind right now, and see who they think are the great um, magazines, right? And so, like, I'm not ready to be publishing in great magazines, but I'm interested in what they like so I can become that good. So I need to be reading the great magazines. And then I'm trying to get, I'm making us all sick. I apologize. Trying to get down to smoke long so I can show you. So when I started working on Flash as a way to keep myself out there while I was doing longer projects, I knew Smoke Long was one of the sort of, oh, I'm just getting motion sick scrolling through this. 
um, one of the top magazines for um, flash fiction. And I don't know, I think I learned that from my partner at Birch Bark Editing, and she knows more than I do. So here we go, smoke long quarterly. So I'll click on it, right? And Duotrope is gonna teach me about Smoke Wong. Um, they take voluntary fees. Right now their fees are um, to help education in a third world country that I have forgotten the name of. And it's open for submissions. And so you can see if you're doing fiction, they, they have um, a broad audience, they take flash and they do pay if you get published um, and they get a lot of submissions. They also take nonfiction. Again, it's flash. That's all they do, right? So then we can scroll down and say, what do we know about this market? The project, this project, which is the market for Smoke Long, 25 fastest fiction and nonfiction responses. And it's also in the top 25 most challenging nonfiction publishers, right? So we're like, okay, um, top 25 challenging. Why am I submitting there? It's because it's a really good flash though. So now I come down here to this. So like, here's the stats on um, who, how many people they respond to. And we report our own responses. So the reason it's 97.37% is probably somebody using Duotrope didn't mark when it was rejected or accepted, right? Um, but of those people submitting, only 1.49% of them are accepted. And honestly, like anything that's above about a 2% acceptance rate is pretty positive because especially in the pandemic, so many people have been writing and submitting submission. I mean, acceptance rates are low at most magazines. So then I go down here and I look at work submitted here was also submitted too. And that helps me just find places to explore. You know, I need to, I've been, I've been reading and Wigleaf is really cool. Craft is super cool. But if you click on these, you'll find that they're really hard to get into. They're among the top brevity is like, the top nonfiction flash place out there, right? Um, so they're hard to get into, but they're here. Also, it's fun to see that members who had their work accepted at Smoke Long also had it accepted at places like the Cincinnati Review, the Rumpus, right? So now look at what you can do. You could spend an entire day just exploring all the stuff related to Smoke Long. Um, so what you do is you get out there and you browse around magazines. A ton of them will have material available for you to read right there on the internet without buying anything. Then you can start to see what they're accepting, what they like, and you can go out there and start finding magazines that have material that is like what you're writing. So you just need to find that match, you know, who's, who's accepting work that's similar to what you're writing. And this is how you can search for it to try to publish there. Um, and then one of the cool things about this, once you are submitting, is I can go to submission responses, right? And when I first click this, Duotrope will show me um, who all is responding right now. So this happens like when the people in Duotrope are like, oh, I got a rejection or oh, I got a acceptance, um, they report it. So we know like the readers are active in the magazine we can find out what's going on. So now I can switch it from all listings to the ones in my pending submission list. And I know that um, Micro was responding four days ago and the Adwat Journal was responding, you know, five days ago. I can see that Adwat did a like 116 day rejection. And I think what I have there is only, you know, been there for like, 20 days. So I'm a long ways from hearing from them, right? And then for micro, I think my piece has been in there. Um, I don't remember how long, but they've had a 33 day rejection. So that also gives me a sense that they're active right now and how close I am to hearing from them. Um, and so far, most of those have been that they don't want to see it, um, but some of them have been better than form rejections, which is encouraging. So like micro has been there 12 days. I'm always from hearing from them and Adwad's been there 50 days. So, you know, I'm probably two months away from hearing from that. Does that all make sense? Yeah, this is very helpful. I didn't even know about this website. Right, this is why I do this in the middle of this class so that you can um, learn how to get out there. And I mean, it takes personal exploring to find what fits you, but you have to know like a place to start exploring, right? <laughs> 
So um, the other thing to keep in mind, I mean, this is just so helpful because it shortcuts a lot of things for you, but you can just dig out there on the internet and find stuff. Um, to encourage you, one of my students who I helped apply for the MFA program, um, when she graduated from the MFA program, she got her book published. And then she just posted on Facebook like yesterday that she had a piece that we'd actually worked on together way in its early stages. Like she's had a lot of other help beyond me now, but it's it's in a literary magazine right now too. So, you know, she's really doing well and you just have to get out there. Um, and a lot of this falls on authors these days to discover and to look at. So um, I'm gonna open a new tab just to show you guys. I've, I've talked to you about Lit Hub and Lit Hub is all kinds of things, right? Um, but it's a pretty fun source to get great, um, like it's super hard to get published in LitHub. And so the, the people that I learned from are the people who are writing in here and people beyond who I've learned from, right? Um, but, you know, here's crafting criticism, there's fiction and poetry, news and culture, right? Um, reading lists, you know, all kinds of stuff. So this is a great website to explore. And a lot of times you'll get ideas um, one of the most important things you need to do is read the biographies. Every time you find something that you like, read about that person and where they've been published. And if, if you admire what they did, go look at the, the places they've been published beyond just the books they've written. Okay, so how's that sound so far? I'm getting nods, that's good, okay. <laughs> So um, that's just a little exploration into the resources that I know of that are out there. There's more. Um, with our business, we pay for our Publishers Marketplace, which is a really interesting place to look at the way that the book world works and to see like what agents are making deals, um, you know, who's sort of top agents or looking at the way things work in um, You hear this when I do your, your verbal feedback too. I just lose my train of thought um, because I was thinking about this agent. So anyway, um, Publishers Marketplace shows you like novels that are coming out, agents that are making deals, and it lets you kind of anticipate the way that the publishing world is happening, but it's $25 a month. So for that one, if you want to take a look at things, if you say have a manuscript that's getting close to being where you want to send it to an agent or something, it might be worth one month's subscription to dig around and find agents and do that kind of thing. Um, but it's too expensive to have a steady subscription to unless, for example, we're bringing in money by um, having a business. And so we have a subscription because it makes us a better editing company for people, you know, because we can explore all this stuff at our cost. All right, so that's your professionalism conversation for your Saturday morning. Um, I did want to talk a little bit because module six is such an amazing opportunity to really kind of go into revision with a lot of experimentation. It's a, it's a module on character development. And here's the thing, for the rest of English 529, we are revising what you drafted and that I'm turning back to you hopefully in a few hours. And um, in that, so, so many of you are very close to having a solid story. Now's your chance to really experiment to find out what could take your story to the next level. So um, for a bunch of people, I'm either recommending that like you dig down into characters, which we're doing next time, or for people whose stories are pretty on track at this moment, um, but are full length or too long. I've had some of those too. I, I want people to try to push things back to like 2000 words and get the entire story written in 2000 words. And the reason I'm saying that, and you don't need to do it for module six, um, but I want you to do it on your way to your next draft. And the reason I'm suggesting that, and, it, and that's a push back. So say you only sent me 1500 words, push it back to a thousand then. Um, the idea is, and this is the advice I'm giving people, so I'm repeating what some of you are hearing on your verbal feedback, but um, my second term advisor at Bennington Writing Seminars was Susan Cheever, John Cheever's daughter, and she is a fiction and nonfiction writer. This advice she gave, it's frustrating. I've done it, but it's really frustrating. Um, and she says, take your story, put it away, ignore it for a little while, and then from memory, write it again. <laughs> Just 
just your brain is like, why? I've already done this. And so um, one thing, the first thing that happens is your brain is a little bored and shortcuts you. It'll shorten the story because it's like, yeah, 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 yeah. I know, I know. And you have to kind of push that aside and say, no, we're going to write seriously and we're going to write well. Um, but two, you won't remember exactly what's in your story. And so what distills out as you're writing it will be what seems to matter the most to your brain for the story. And having done this, and she wants you to do it five times. <laughs> do, it, do it once for sure. <laughs> but I did it once for three times. And by the third time, I was like, okay, three is enough. I mean, I just can't. But I was amazed by the process and the experience. So one of the things that I would advise as a writer is that you have to be tricking your brain constantly because, you know, my brain has been almost 53 years, like two days before grades are due, I'm going to turn 53. It's been like doing its job for this long. It's like, yeah, I got it. Let's just go. And I'm like, no, no, <laughs> I need to trick you now because there's better stuff in there. And your brain's like, this is good enough. Look at this great figurative language we use. Let's go. And I'm like, no, what if it's not the right figurative language? So when you're making decisions, most of you I'm asking for more sensory language and for more rhetorical devices, especially figurative language. And in that, when you make those choices, some people are doing some really beautiful like metaphors, just make sure that they're advancing the story at the same time. So go back and look at the choices you've made and maybe, you know, the taste of something's going to change the way we see how the story is gone. So um, anytime you're making those choices, as I, you know, obviously you're writing to the rubric in this class, but the rubric's been designed to make you better writers. And so as you're writing towards the concepts, and I'm saying, I want more figurative language, I want more rhetorical devices, <laughs> um, which I will probably always say, it's all to get that kind of magical twist in your writing that makes it get become more than just a story that's plodding along. So um, make sure when you're consciously doing that, that the choice is expanding the story. If you wanna say that the touch was as light as butterfly wings, great, but what do butterflies have to do with your story? And that's, I know that sounds crazy and it might be everything. It might be that you're kind of dealing with the butterfly effect and that's the perfect choice because it's something set into motion that creates this chaos that we can't predict. But maybe there would be another way to describe a light touch that went closer to your story, right? And then finally, um, I wanna just talk about these little things and I'm pulling all this information so you can go to it yourself if you want. The masterclass that Judy Bloom does on character development, I'm stealing directly from her right now. So if you wanna review what I'm saying, go read that. And also I'm pulling the writing prompts from her today. I can't believe I haven't found this article before, but when I was preparing for this morning, perfect stuff. So um, the biggest thing is you have to be sure, and I was just reading this actually from George Sanders, Saunders last night, every character has to have desire. And actually Kurt Vonnegut too, he was saying the same thing. So as we're getting ready, and now I'm like, I'm sliding us down to where we're going to do some writing prompts, but they're going to be based off of character. And so as we're getting ready for the writing prompts, I would love for you to be thinking about like your primary character, the one that's sort of the protagonist in your story. And what does that character want? And that's the biggest thing. Like every character in every story wants something. And so I want you thinking about what is the desire for your character and what propels them to do what they're doing. It's the same thing, you know, they're being propelled towards what will satisfy their desire. And then your job as an author is to either help them get there or thwart their desire. And in fact, usually you should thwart it along the way to be interesting. Um, but, you know, either at the end of the story, your, your character will be getting their desire or they will be thwarted in getting their desire and continuing to struggle. And, and both are viable ways to go, but that's what stories are about is desire. And, and in doing this with characters that become round is the word we've heard, three-dimensional is another way we've heard it. The way that they become three-dimensional, the first thing is they have flaws, right? So, um, Gosh, I, the last two people that I worked on last night were Wynn and Amy. Well, Amy was this morning and Wynn was last night. And Casey, I'm just trying to think through 
um, because your last name starts with an E, I graded you like two days ago. So I just have to remember what your story is about. So when you get a chance to unmute, um, remind me and I'll be able to tell you. But like in Wynn's case, she has Ursula and Luna, um, but also you have Loki and um, Officer, whose name I forgot. But your main characters are Ursula and Luna. What do they desire the most? And then what what flaws do they have? Like right now they're really good dogs. So like, what is it that makes them less than perfect dogs? And that's something to think about as we're moving into this. For Amy, um, we have this, oh, oh, and this is in here too. Your characters need to be powerful. And so like with Wynn's dogs, they're both like confident. They know what they want to do. They're out there going to get stuff. So they're powerful in that sense. Amy's woman wants what she wants, which is to have her own farm and to direct her own life and so in her case she's super powerful and I don't see a whole lot of flaws in her yet you know um she's hard working and she knows how to go for what she wants but I don't know what's also wrong with her so think about your characters and think about what flaws they might have and this might be a good thing to write about today um your character in a short story typically will have its own arc so they will um start somewhere and finish somewhere else in their development as a person um, and for amy that's easy to see because you know she's trying to get this farm and we can see that by the the leap forward 10 years we see that she gets what she wants in Wynn's case it's extra complicated because they only get a week to be like they are and so i had a bunch of questions when i was reviewing you like you know if they get a taste of what it's like to be sort of free how do they go back to being regular dogs that kind of thing so what is their narrative arc as well um, and then your characters need to be interesting, and all of yours are, but they don't necessarily need to be likable. And that's, you know, <laughs> I'm having such a hard time in Yellowstone. We're watching this right now, my husband and I, and I hadn't seen it before, but the sister character, Beth, in Yellowstone is so interesting, and I do not like her, but I kind of admire her. And so it's something like that, where if you can think of a character where you're like, yeah, I would not want to sit and have coffee with you, but I get you, you know, that's the kind of thing to keep in mind. And then in the end, take it, even tiny opportunities to subvert your reader's expectations. And that's, I think, a really important one. That's why I'm talking to you from this article, because all of it resonated with me. Um, you know, so uh, <laughs> I have a character, oh, is Casey's character Willow? Somebody's writing about a willow and I have a willow I'm writing a novel about. And I like her so much. I can't bring myself to make the bad stuff happen to her. That's why I went back to my memoir for now because I have to get a little emotional distance from willow so that I can do the bad things to her. And if you Google um, Kurt Vonnegut's advice about um, novel writing and characters, I was reading that last night as well. And he's the one that says like, you have to put them through trauma. <laughs> no. And, and if you don't, then you're not doing your readers a favor because it's that tension. Like sometimes I'm reading and I'm just miserable because, you know, I don't want what's happening to the characters I'm reading to happen. And then I now these days as reading like a writer, I pause and admire <laughs> how the author managed to do these awful things to a character they clearly love. Right. So just keep in mind that you have to when they talk about kill your darlings, that can be sort of two things, which is. Um, sometimes you just love something you've written and it's so cute that you just need to get rid of it because it's not serving the purpose of your story. It's more like a, look at this writerly thing I did. And that's what they really mean by killing your darlings. But also killing your darlings can mean torturing your characters a little bit. And I, I'm not talking about literally, but because we like them so much, you know, we have to, um, we have to be ready to hurt them a little bit too. Sorry. Okay, whoo, huge lecture. I've been doing this for like 25 minutes, I'm sorry. But I really wanted to show those resources to you. And then I did wanna talk more about this, these ideas for character development because this is what we're doing for module six. And when you, you need to take a kind of short scene, you know, like not more than a paragraph or two, and then you're gonna rewrite it to show us a, like something else about the character. You know, you're going to show us the character in some new light from something you've already written. and so. Um, I just want to encourage you to use today's writing exercises to help you think about how you might do that. Okay.
here we are. Casey, I don't know if you're there yet to um, do writing exercises, but I'm here. Okay, good. No, I mean to where you could actually write. I hope you're home because I've been at this for a while. Okay. So oh, yeah. I'm going to get my timer out and then um, I'm going to do this time because I think I forgot last time. Um, I need to, you don't need a 50 minute timer. <laughs> okay. I'm going to ask us to remember to do a little bit of breathing and I'm going to like kind of calm and focus us. And so as I'm going to ask you to breathe, I want you to think about the, the primary protagonist character with when I want to say you have two of them right now, but I would, um, I would recommend that you decide sort of who's the primary dog and it's possibly Ursula because that seems to be the most um, responsible character. She's the one that has dog bows, so you have a chance at least with her. Casey, please remind me of who your characters are. Sorry, I couldn't hear you for a second. What was that? Please remind me of who your characters are. I just, I have like 42 of you and sometimes I can't get it off the top of my head. I think it's Willow and Lily. Your character is Willow, the, the one with the witch? Yep. <laughs> I was right. I guess that was it. I was right. See, I even remembered. I'm so proud of myself. Um, I, I'm not going to lie. I used my cat's name because I didn't have any other ideas. I'm not going to lie. I'm trying to like allude to Willa Cather because I'm a Willa Cather scholar. And so I went Willow instead of Willa. <laughs> okay. So think about like Willow it. as we're working on this. And I'm just going to take us for a moment and ask you to sort of um, close your eyes and we're going to breathe in through our noses and then out through our mouths. We're going to do two more of these quietly thinking about our character. Now I know why you can't hear me. <laughs> I've had my headphones plugged in the whole time and I'm not wearing them. Okay. Can you hear me okay now? A nodding head would suffice. Okay, great. All right, so now be focused on your characters and um, I'm gonna choose the second writing exercise that Judy Bloom gave in this masterclass. And I want you to pick an event from your character's past, something that's not in your story. I want you to pick an event from your character's past and elaborate on it. For example is like, does your hero have a back injury from an accident when he was in the Navy? Does that person move differently now? Do people treat him differently? What are the psychological repercussions of the accident? So think about your character's past experiences, things that you haven't already put in your story. Because you know, when you think about that Proust questionnaire you did in English 520, that's the kind of stuff way back in the, the details about this character that we don't know yet. Pick something we don't know and then go ahead and write that out. Just like, you know, it does, this doesn't have to be narrative. This can be just information about the character. Um, and so like in it, elaborate on what happened in this event and what it means to your character. And we're gonna spend five minutes working on that. So get your pens or if you're doing it on your computer, I, will, I wanna remind, because I have actually remembered to record that the way that your brain engages when you handwrite is different than the way it does when you type. And so I highly recommend doing some drafting, some, you know, like even if it's just short five minute bursts writing by hand, because you cross your brain's hemispheres in a different way and it can create some more creative moments. Okay, so choose an event from your character's past, elaborate on it. What does it mean to your character? What does it mean to your overall narrative that you're writing? Go ahead and start.
You have just over a minute left. Okay, time's up. Please start wrapping up your work and go back up on the screen. All right, I'm really eager to hear what you got and learn more about your characters. Um, first, can we just start off with some easy stuff like how did it go for you and was this helpful? And anybody can jump in. I'll call when I see a mute going off so people know that somebody's coming in. Amy? So I um, ended up writing just a list of questions. Oh. Um, so that was kind of interesting. So in my story, there's one line about the main character's mother dying. Mm -hmm. So I started thinking about that because I hadn't thought about that. And I just ended up with a, a bunch of questions. How did she die? When did she die? You know, was it like a long-term illness? Was there any dream that she didn't get to do because she died? Um, how old was Charlotte? So I just wrote a huge bunch of questions. I didn't really have any answers, but it was something that I hadn't thought about before. That's fantastic because I think that 100% impacts Charlotte because, you know, what if her mom's dreams were cut short? What if Charlotte was stuck nursing her because her sister had married into another family? Like there's all kinds of possibilities that influence the choices Charlotte's making, right? Mm -hmm. That's a great idea. Oh, what a good start. So it was helpful. Yeah. And in your case, you're writing a like a true fiction, right? Um, very loosely based. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The only so. uh, the only the only thing that's true about it is that because I dabble in like genealogy work, and the only thing that's true is. I had a ancestor that worked at a dress shop during a census. Oh, and then uh, when I looked at the census record 10 years later, she was living on a farm and married. So everything else is made up. Oh, that's great. OK, so, well, then my my advice to read Georgia Hunters, we were the lucky ones may not be good, but um, it's still worth looking at because she wrote she had all the facts of a family, but none of the like emotional details. It's a really interesting. Yeah, novel. I just. For some reason, the, the idea that she was like in one city and then 10 years later was somewhere completely different kind of intrigued me. So, uh -huh. that's, so, yeah, great. So, when or Casey, was this helpful to you? Yeah, it was when? helpful. It was a good um, idea to go back and see where Ursula came from and her traumas and what led her to be more responsible and more of a role model. And what kind of information, like what did you end up writing down? Anything worth sharing? Um, I wrote Ursula came from an abusive home and ended up being in a Doberman rescue. Her past trauma was that because she had awful previous owners, 
Any loud noises such as fireworks, gunshots, or even the bleeping sound on TV would terrify her. Because of this tra trauma, Ursa tries her best to be the most well-behaved dogs and a loyal companion to her new owners who adopted her. She is protective of her sister Luna and tries her best to be good role models so that she would not have to battle the same traumas and hardships that Ursula went through. Oh, nice. Yeah, that makes perfect sense that she's like protective because mm -hmm. of her own experiences. Yeah, yeah, or even like cursing. All the bleeps would just scare the heck out of her because <laughs> her previous owners used to just cuss her out a lot. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> yeah. That's going to be helpful, I think, as you move forward with your story. I'm going to talk about um, narrative in just a second. So that's good because the next one we're going to do narrative. So, but I want to see Casey, are you there? Are you able to tell us about your experience? Yeah. I thought it was really cool because it kind of forced me to think back to like how far back did she start to feel isolated from her family and other people around her? So I kind of focused on like a day at school in the lunchroom. Ah. And it just got me to really think a lot deeper about that and how she always kind of felt isolated. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that I so. say in your feedback that I think matters, you know, when I was talking about Judy Bloom saying that your characters need to be powerful, one of the things that is so neat about Willow is that she's um, she resists the witch longer than anybody else has. And so her isolation and her seeming non-belonging does not preclude the idea that she's powerful. She is powerful. Um, and in fighting off the witch as long as she does, you know, we're showing that power. And so, and I talked more about this in your feedback, but basically um, I like this idea that you're trying to examine when did she feel different? And I think that you ultimately say in your story that this makes her more powerful because she's got to stand on her own. That's the goal. I need to work that in there a little bit better, I feel like, because like, as I was writing that first real draft, I knew what I wanted to say and I was trying to get it out, but my brain was going a lot faster than I could write or type and so it's like, okay, get as much out there as I can and then go back and tweak it. Yeah, and the great thing for all of you that English 529 does is it gives you these forced deadlines. And by having them and having a draft that you don't think is fully complete, it, it mimics when you have to stop writing in real life. Like, you know, like the whole time I was in my MFA program, I was like, how do I, you know, equate the pressure this program is putting me under to when I'll write when I'm outside of the program and I don't have real deadlines? And so when you stop writing for, say, a night or you're out of time or whatever, um, your brain will have done whatever to hand me a draft in English 529 in life later when you're not in school. You'll be in a certain place and you can recognize, okay, not everything is how I want it to be, but now I have tools to revise because you worked on it in school. And so, like, You've had that you've practiced the experience by having these artificial deadlines in 529, and now you can apply them to your own writing after we're done with school. It's gonna be great. <laughs> okay, so I feel like this was useful. I briefly want to talk a bit about um, narrative versus information, because for most of you, you were writing down information, which is great. And when you have a little bit of this in your story where you begin and end with kind of information. And so I talked to you about this in your feedback, but I'm encouraging you to put it all sort of into narrative scene. And in order to practice that, I want not just for Wynn, but for all of you, I want us to now work on your characters again. And I'm gonna give you two possible directions to go um, just because I don't wanna limit you too much and Judy Bloom has great ideas. So, um, you can write them both down. And also, I just realized I should have put them in the chat. <laughs> so this time I'll put them in the chat in case you need to refer back to them. Um, but this time I want you to think of story and um, write it as if you're telling me the story now. So when in your case, this is when they're actually at the fair and you're doing dialogue and you're having sensory language and you're using your figurative language. For Amy, um, it could be either when they're in the store or you could take it to the farm. That's up to you. I know that, you know, you may never use any of this in your writing, but we're just practicing today. And Casey, this could be either before or after the possession, right? Um, so we've been thinking about something 
you know, that maybe changed your character's life, you could use that or you can jump in anywhere you want. And the first possibility that I want you to write in story form, like in scene, is um, choose one of the character's personality traits. Like Wynne was saying that Ursula is, you know, startled really easily. Um, choose a personality trait and list the ways that it's expressed. Um, if this person is um, nervous, they might bounce their knee. Um, they could pluck at their sleeves. And of course, Judy Bloom says they could startle easily, which Wynne has already said. That's one thing you can do is pick a personality trait and then start to write a little scene where that personality trait gets expressed. You know, so um, if, if it's being startled, when should write a scene where Ursula gets startled, which at a state fair seems really easy to do. Um, the second possibility is about space. So you could write within your story a space that your character has created for themselves. It could be, you know, something that isn't even showing in your story, like their bedroom. Um, most of your characters don't have cars, so that won't work. <laughs> the perfectly stocked kitchen, so maybe the farm, you know, 10 years later, or for Casey, um, the bedroom where her little sister Ashley is coming in to talk to her, right? Um, anyway, some space that was put together by your character, um, you know, when it might be like a dog bed space where they bring their favorite toys, you know, I, I'm not really sure how they create their space, but you might be able to do that. So pick either an expression of a personality trait or a space that your character put together and write in scene about that. So, you know, be giving me physical details like how things smell, what they sound like, maybe taste, um, sight if you want, touch, you know, what's the texture of things. When you're writing about this, be sure that you're engaging the five senses and that you're thinking about it like something is like something else. Like, you know, the sheepskin dog bed was like sleeping on a dream or a cloud or something like that. Okay, so I'm gonna pop these up in the chat in case you need to read them over again. And I'm gonna give you seven minutes this time just because um, this one's a little bit longer, harder, more to think about. Okay, so when you're ready, get set, right.
You have a minute left. Okay, try to wrap things up, please. You all must really be on a roll or you can't hear me one or the other. <laughs> I would love to hear from you all how that was different. The first one was more informative and this one was more creative. And so I wanna hear how it went. And if you feel up for it, I'd love to hear what you wrote. I feel like this one a little bit better for me. Okay. Um, because like I was thinking about the room when she was in it, but, or how it is, at the start of the story, but during the day. And it's like, the idea is that the character left but came back and it's not, it's even less of a home than before she left. And I want to incorporate that in, um, but I wrote about how the uh, floors are cold hard wood, there's a carpet or a rug in the middle that the bed sits on and that's like an island paradise and then how there's a fan over it that shakes and in old houses sometimes those fans shake a lot and it's like when is it going to come crashing down and like <laughs> almost like a time limit to when and I tried to use the metaphor of the meteor that killed the dinosaurs like oh. eventually this fan would come crashing down and destroy her paradise Oh, nice. So do you have something that you're willing to read in narrative or you just do you want to describe it like you have? Oh, I can read it. It's just, yeah. My handwriting is really bad. So forgive me <laughs> if I uh, have to pause for a minute. This happens in morning Nine meditation days. all the time. Like we can't read what we wrote. So no problem. <laughs> An icy hardwood floor uh, surrounds a central rug that acts as an island to anchor the bed. The bed is the only form of comfort within the bare room, as it overflows with soft fleece and clouds masquerading as pillows. Flashes of greens and blues make the bed seem like a lush paradise compared to the stark fleece white walls and gauzy curtains that look more like medical supplies than fancy antique lace. The ceiling fan shakes as the fan comes to life over the bed. Loud clamoring makes me think it will crash down on my island of solitude, like the meteor that killed the dinosaurs. Nice. I really love the thing that your description has got me thinking of with the gauzy medical supplies for curtains is which items in the room did she choose, did Willow choose, and which items were provided for her room, like the fan and the curtains and the difference between them and her affection for them. Does that make sense? Yeah. So maybe that'll keep you pushing towards like 
how she creates her own comfort outside of the by feeling, you know, a little rejected by everybody else in her life. When or Amy, did you notice anything in Casey wrote that you wanted to comment on? I um, did notice that ending about the dinosaurs crashing. It kind of made me wonder what was going to happen in the character's life. I mean, was yeah. I felt the same about the meter and dinosaur too. So that brought my attention. <laughs> the nice foreshadowing, right? That created mm -hmm. dramatic tension in the story because she wouldn't use that kind of metaphor unless it was predicting something like that for the character, right? Yep. yep. Excellent. Well, that's a good start. Okay, so um, I love what you came up with, Casey. Amy or Wynn, do either of you wanna talk about what you came up with? Um, sure, I'll, I'll come up with, tell you what I came up with. I have a, actually have a really hard time adding like metaphors and figurative language. Um, I'm kind of just a direct person. <laughs> so it's really hard. <laughs> So I just, I have a hard time with this. So, um, so I said, Charlotte entered her bedroom and sighed. Long day, she whispered, running her hand across the edge of the dome-shaped round tr trunk before opening it, the paintbrushes alone in the corner of the trunk. The canvas still on the, the corner of the, of the room. I'm too tired, my hands hurt, she said, rubbing them together. So I'm kind of struggling with adding metaphors. I don't mm -hmm. talk like that. I, yeah. I don't. I'm not. I'm. I'm kind of a straightforward person. And I don't know if that's just because I am a math teacher, <laughs> but I. It's. I can describe things, but I'm having a hard time like adding the similes and the metaphors and all the flowery stuff. Sure. Sure. Um. So for one, I, I can really see that moment, especially because I know the time period and I just read the story. So um, I can I can get a sense of this like um, arching trunk, you know, and I know mm -hmm. she has this canvas in the corner. So um, some things to think about, and I'm gonna try to find, I, I asked Janet Fitch if it was okay, and it is. I'm gonna try to find a material that I have that describes um, how to practice coming up with metaphors and really unusual ones instead of, um, your cat has a mustache, <laughs> um, really unusual ones instead of cliches. And so it, because it, it isn't always natural for us and it isn't even natural for me, like in everyday life, you won't find mm -hmm. me using them at all. But in writing, I've grown to know how to use them. And so for example, um, your character wants to take charge of her own life and she isn't. Right. So when she opens the trunk, and she sees these supplies she wants to use and her hands are too tired. She's too tired, like her hands hurt. You know, you, what you'll start doing is thinking of the ways that you can say that um, the materials inside there represent the life she wants. Okay. So you, just, you just have to think about how you could say, you know, the, the canvas, I, I'm, I'll say this every time I give you oral feedback too, I'm terrible off the top of my head. This is why I'm, right, I'm a writer, but, the canvas in the corner of the room. Um, if she hadn't painted on it yet, it could be like a ghost waiting to be seen or, um, you know, like it, it was as lonely as like some item of clothing that she hasn't used yet or, you know, like try to, try to take the emotions that your character attaches to these items and then tie them to what the future is that she wants. Like when we started off this conversation, we talked about desire. And, um, you know, Willow wants to be seen. Ursula and Luna want to have like this kind of human experience, this great opportunity to go have very individual fun that belongs to dogs. And Charlotte wants out of this life, but also into a life that she knows, like on the farm, she's really confident in her ability to run a farm and carve out time for her passion. So her true desire is orchestrating her life so she can paint and what is you know how do you attach emotions to these items that are being neglected because I mean talk about the big more metaphor for all of our lives like this is absolutely what my military memoir is about which is 
I joined the military so that I would be financially secure. And then, you know, I stayed and now I have a pension and I'm doing this stuff, right? So I'm following my passion because I'm thinking about writing and I'm writing every day. And so what does it take for Charlotte to follow her passion? And then how do those items represent the passion? And then how can you have them meet in the middle with metaphors and similes? And I for one, so this is something that I'm writing about in my memoir. Um, I come from a like non-emotionally just demonstrative family and I have a bachelor of science degree, <laughs> you know, like I, I have a lot of commonalities with you. And so it's taken a long time of me reading like a writer with other people's metaphors and studying how to create that translation. I mean, I had to learn how to apply it and you will too, I promise. <laughs> Thanks for those ideas. Great. Wynn, do you want to share what you got? Sure. Um, a tiresome Ursula went to her room as she smelled the strong scents of pepperoni, cereal, and rice cakes just scattered all over her bed. Ursula was tired and just wanted to lay down. She yelled at Luna to come in. Luna, did you get into Ryan's cereal, rice cakes, and la leftover pizza again? Luna whimpered with her head down and said, no. Well, Ursula said scoldingly, I want to head to bed. Can you please help me clean this up? The two dogs licked up the food on Ursula's bed. Now the bed is just wet and smells like dog spit. Ursula didn't care and plopped down on the bed to lay down and sleep. She drifted, she drifted off to sleep and started whimpering in her sleep as she starts to dream of an adventure at a state super fair. Her surroundings were magical with rides and smells of farm animals and food galore. Ooh, I think you just found an entry into your, your deep dream sequence. <laughs> <laughs> so a better introduction. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because I think that helps us it kind of, so now we have a main character who's Ursula and we're going to go to the fair through her dreams. And then like she gets mm -hmm. to remain a dog, but she gets to be a character and we get mm -hmm. to have like, you know, she's witnessed her. And I'm sorry, I, I have a friend named Ruan, so I've been saying Ruan <laughs> the whole time. It's like it's Ryan with an I. <laughs> and Ruan's name is spelled R-U-A-N. So, I mean, my mistake uh -huh. is, you know, explainable. Um, mm -hmm. I love this idea that, you know, then we can kind of go with her into this dreamland and buy it all as adults. Because right now it's very much sort of, you know, the kind of story that children would be really interested in because it's, transactions with speaking animals, but now mm -hmm. it can kind of do two things in inner two worlds. So I'm very excited by that. Yay. <laughs> <Good> start. <laughs> because in the end, she ends up eating pizza with Loki and, and Luna, right? And that's uh -huh. because she goes to pizza the smells. Yeah. So then the one thing that I would add is that, you know, you're doing these sensory details and we know that it's wet and we know that it smells like rice cakes and pepperoni um, and all those are great details. And then last step that I would ask you to be thinking about as you're moving forward with this is how again would you maybe translate that? So like, did the bed smell like a pizza? You know, so <laughs> beyond just pepperoni, you know, Ursula can think something like this bed smells like a pizza and now you have figurative language in there too because that's a simile, right? So just be thinking about the ways that you can bring in those translations. And again, I say this all the time, but it's because, you know, we have these vivid ideas, like hilariously, you know, I'm sure my dog bed in my mind is 100% different than Ursula's actual bed. Um, so what you do for me each time you give me a description is you help tweak my perspective of the story closer to what your perspective is. And that's what sensory language does. And that's what especially figurative language does. And the kind of cool thing I think about writing and about reading is that you only tweak the most important details to me. Like you allow me to have her bed be blue and it doesn't matter because the color doesn't matter. But what does matter is that it smells like pizza. And so you give me that <laughs> piece and we meet together for pizza. And then we go along with our two different pictures that are, that are happening. And then you're like, but there's going to be a Ferris wheel with seats designed for dogs or whatever. And you show me what that, you know, the seats were like um, the swings that kids go on or something to help <laughs> with a hole for dogs or whatever, to help me see what a Ferris wheel that dogs ride on looks like. Because in this dream, the whole thing's set up for animals. So it's got all the things we think of for humans, but designed for dogs, right? So that's why I say the figurative language and um, sensory details 
brings us closer to the same story, but it's always going to be a little bit different. And that's why those details have to be the ones that propel the story in the direction you're trying to take it. So, you know, if, if the, the pizza is a really important thing, the pepperoni, because of the state fair, but if you were to say, and the rice cakes, well, they don't see rice cakes at the fair. So it's <laughs> fine to have that detail, but it's that idea that pizza shows up at the end of the story that lets us know, aha, this happened because she thought her bed smelled like pizza, like the ground and smelled like pepperoni, right? I do I have no idea if it was right. probably square, but this is, this is a great opportunity to just say, you know, you are just asking someone to create a vivid experience of their own, and you have to have the touchstone points that takes them on the same story you're trying to write. I feel like y'all made some awesome progress today. Yeah. <laughs> that um, you discovered some things about your characters. When I really think you narrowed down on a protagonist, which is super exciting. Um, Casey, knowing that Willow's room isn't that like the bed is her oasis, but not the whole room. That's fascinating. I can't wait to hear more about it. And for Amy, I don't know. I wanna I wanna see figurative language. <laughs> And I feel like you've got a few steps in the right direction. I'll dig up that Janet Fitch material and um, probably I'll just stick it in the comments for the YouTube video so that you guys can just find it and have it associated with the information we've talked about today. Thanks. Yeah. Do y'all have any Thank questions? You. Anything that you want to ask hmm. me about the class or what we're doing before we head off? I did have a question about the journal that's due this week. Mm -hmm. So I wrote it up, but then I noticed it also needs to have some research yes. with it from the yes. library. Um, I'm having a hard time coming up with a research question to even find research to include in the journal. Because yeah. it sounds more like, where do you want your story to go? Yeah. What um, are your goals? So I mean... <laughs> Yeah, I'm trying to find, I have, I opened up this thing just to answer this question because I thought it might come up. Um, is this the, oh darn it, I'm trying to find, okay, I'll just go to module five. <clears throat> Consider your goals as a fiction writer. What sub-genres of fiction are you interested in writing? That's the entry point I think you have to find your research is when you talk okay. about genres. And so um, I think like you're writing historical fiction, right? Amy? Mm -hmm. And so, and it doesn't have to be from the library, although the library is an important resource for creative writing. A lot of your stuff will come off of the internet just because writers are trying to um, commercialize their information because it's really hard to make money as a writer. So then it's just up to you to make sure you have a credible website. And you, what you need to do is just take a look at, you know, is it a .com and if it is, does their success as a .com website rely on the quality and reliability of their material? So something like Masterclass is a .com, but mm -hmm. their reputation resides entirely on being excellent, right? So, you know, Masterclass is something for creative writing, absolutely, absolutely you can use as a resource because they're relying on their um, credibility. Um, Writers Write is one, Do It Yourself, it's DIY, MFA is one. Um, that literarydevices.net is a good one. So there's a lot of different websites that are credible that you can go to for resources. And so then maybe define the subgenre of historical fiction for me so that we're on the same page that you mean the same thing by historical fiction as I do. Um, or like if you're trying to accomplish something with a universal theme or uh, an important like philosophical idea, just dig around um, to see what writers are talking about, you know, making meaning in your short stories. And you might find some research that supports you there. Okay. Yeah, I was completely off. <laughs> I was going to like that JSTOR that does the academic journals and I was typing things like writer's purpose. <laughs> so yeah, thank you for clarifying that. That will be much easier than what I thought. So. Oh, good. And one thing that I'll just add, as I said this, um, that exploration of like writer's purpose, you know, if you Google it and you look for quality sites, this is the way that you start breaking down how writing happens and what you're trying to accomplish with it. 
So just, you know, when you have free time, don't be afraid to play Google on it and even read the ones that you aren't sure are credible and you'll begin to learn the difference between the two. You know, if somebody's just writing a blog to try to get more traffic so they can maybe sell a book and they're a newer author, it doesn't mean they don't know what they're talking about. Or maybe it does mean they don't know what they're talking about, but you'll learn to distinguish it. And that helps you like understand what writing is helpful for you and what writing isn't. Does anybody else have questions? That was a great I think there was question. something you were going to tell me, but I don't remember. I just remember Did you mentioned my name and telling me something later. Oh, um, it had to do with writing and scene, I think. But you okay. wrote in scene, so I don't, I'm sorry. <laughs> Oh, you know, my short term memory. You guys wait till you're in your 50s. You're all women. Your hormones <laughs> do some horrible things to you. Um, if I think specifically, like if it was really important, then um, I will remember and I will email you. But I think I was just going to talk about for not feeling safe, like the thing I already talked about. I don't know. Okay. Um, I, I really hey, like it. Sorry. It's all good, believe me. It's been like crazy. So I understand when you just don't remember. Yeah, I mean, I just don't remember. I think I was saying we were going to talk about narrative, and I might have been referring to when, but maybe not. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> anyway, okay. um, I do really like Willow as a character, though. I think she's super powerful, and I think you need to keep capitalizing on that. And I feel like you're on track because I picked up on that, but I agree with you that you want to. You want to be threading that out a little more, like uh, braiding it in a little more. Okay. Well, I got to thinking about my own writing thanks to this morning. So I appreciate that you're helping me at the same time. <laughs> and uh, if you have questions, I'm always available by email. And and no, like, so when I wrote everybody, I was like, oh no, I had all these emails waiting for me. My outlook is not always behaving. So if you haven't heard from me within 24 hours, it means I didn't see it. Because at a minimum, I will write and say, like, I'm doing this right now, but I'll get back to you, I promise. Like, I, you know, my standard is 24 hours. So if you haven't heard back from me, I didn't see it. The number on the email signature block that I have, you can text that anytime. I only ask for an appointment if we're actually gonna talk on the phone, just because I'm not always available. But you can text me anytime and that has without fail shown up on my phone. So if I'm not answering you like in general questions or on um, email, somehow I'm not getting my notifications and you will always at least get a, I will get back to you within 24 hours. So be sure that um, if I'm failing to <laughs> reach out to me in a new way so that I don't fail you, okay? All right, well, I hope you all have a great weekend. Thank you so much for showing up and um, I hope to do this again in two weeks. Yeah, now that that's changing, I should be able to. So tentatively, if you're interested in doing another one, and that one will be us doing um, narrative scene each time. I'll be doing it again, it looks like on September 11th, which, you know, that's a special day. Okay, well, if you don't have more questions, it was great to see you this morning. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you. You're welcome. Thank you so Bye. much. Thanks. Bye.